In this video, we're going to be taking a look at an introduction to Fibonacci numbers, and we will not be going into uh, detailed depth of Fibonacci numbers in the golden mean, but uh, the idea is to whet your appetite to look into the subject a little bit more deeply. Now first, we're going to take a look at a little of the historical background into Fibonacci numbers. Fibonacci, or Leonardo of Pisa, was uh, a merchant, uh, a merchant of the city-state of Pisa, who at the age of 16 moved to North Africa to be with his father to trade with the Arabs. At that time, Italy was the premier European nation or area that traded um, universally um, with the Arabs, uh, who were the intermediates between the Eastern world, uh, China and India, and um, Europe. Europe was pretty backwards in those days and used, mathematically used uh, Roman numeration, which doesn't lend itself to doing calculations. Um, it was a very backwards form of mathematics uh, compared to the, uh, what, the, what the Arabs were using at the time. And Leonardo, being a, a bright young man, quickly realized that the mathematics that the Arabs were using was far superior to uh, what was being practiced in, in Italy at the time. So in the year 1202, uh, Leonardo uh, wrote the book Liber Abaci, <clears throat> which in Latin means about calculating, a book about calculating. And in this book, he proposed uh, switching to the superior Arabic no notation and provided numerous examples of uh, calculations, uh, how they worked, uh, and how they could be done quickly in the field. And that was something that uh, Leonardo noticed uh, when they were bargaining and uh, with the Arabs in their mercantile business in North Africa. And uh, so Leonardo tried to bring it back to Europe with him. Uh, Leonardo was an interesting uh, young man and really is the father of mathematics in the Western world because uh, after the, the fall of the Roman Empire, because during the Dark Ages, Europe had slipped into a period of, of ignorance. Most people uh, couldn't read, uh, couldn't write. Uh, there was an economic depression. Uh, life was pretty chaotic in Europe at the, for several hundred years after the fall of the Roman Empire. And much of the science uh, that had been developed, uh, much of the mathematics and geometry that had been developed by the ancient Greeks uh, was lost to Europe. And However, it was retained by the Arabs who were scientifically and culturally far more advanced than the Europeans who basically were a, a backwater to civilization uh, at that time. And so Leonardo saw an opportunity for Europe to break out of this period of ignorance, and uh, that was what he was doing when he was advertising uh, and promoting the use of Arabic numeration. However, it didn't really catch on in Europe uh, right away. 
it took uh, a couple hundred years before Arabic numeration was finally accepted in whole uh, by Europe. And it was because of the increasing trade, the increasing uh, presence of Italy in particular as a, a mercantile center uh, and uh, banking center uh, of Europe. And they needed a system of mathematics to account for uh, monies. Um, a two-ledger accounting was used by the Italians, and they couldn't use Roman numeration. I mean, Roman numeration is is like trying to add the words uh, five plus two. You just can't do mathematical operations with with um, with word type uh, uh, symbolisms. You needed a practical um, mathematical system that uh, had a, a base. Uh, and in fact, the, the Arabs' um, mathematical system was base 10 with placeholders, and you could actually carry out operations, mathematical operations, with their notation. And it allowed them to do quick calculations right there in the marketplace. So uh, Leonardo was a, a very quick advocate of the uh, use of Arabic no notation. Now, um, in this book, Liber Abaci, Leonardo provided a number of examples. And one of the examples he provided was uh, his famous rabbit problem. And in this problem, he, pro he proposed an algorithm. Now, he didn't realize it was an algorithm, which is basically a set of instructions. Um, algorithms are used in computing in modern uh, days, uh, in, in the age which we're living. Uh, but at the time, um, it, it was something somewhat unique. But Leonardo's rabbit problem uh, went like this. Uh, you start out with a pair of newborn rabbits, uh, male and female. And in their first month of life, they, they don't have babies. But uh, after the first month... And for every month thereafter, they have one pair of babies, male and female. And this is true for each generation. They'll skip the first, gener the first month uh, in propagating and then have babies every month thereafter. So I, I diagrammed that in this slide. And you can see uh, the month. In fact, uh, Fibonacci's question is, uh, given this uh, set of uh, conditions, uh, how many pairs of rabbits will you have at the end of uh, 12 months? And I just uh, outlined the first uh, number of months. And you could see that in the first month you have one pair and the second month you have one pair because they skip a month in propagating in the third month they have their first pair of rabbits and then that pair skips a month in the fourth month but the the first pair has another pair of rabbits um and, and, and this is the way it goes. And the next month, uh, both pairs of rabbits uh, have babies. So you end up with a very rapidly increasing number of rabbits, uh, pairs of rabbits, uh, given this um, proposed way of propagation. And on the right side, you could see uh, I wrote down uh, the mathematical sequence that comes out of this. Uh, you have one pair and one pair, and then two, three, five, eight, thirteen, and at the end of 12 months, you have 144 pairs. 
Well, you may notice that uh, there's a pattern here, and the pattern is uh, somewhat self-evident. And if you notice, at each number, aside from the first two months, one and one, uh, for the first two months, um, every month thereafter, the number of pairs of rabbits depends upon the sum of the previous two months. For example, uh, th the fourth month, uh, there are three pairs, and that is the sum of one and two. Uh, in the fifth month, it's uh, five pairs, and that's the sum of two and three. And so that's how this uh, propagation of this series uh, works. Uh, each number uh, depends on the previous two numbers in the sequence. And in this slide, I, I wrote that sequence out by term um, in a horizontal table. Now you have n, which is the, the term number, and f sub n, which is an introduced notation, uh, that tells you which Fibonacci number um, for a particular term. For example, when n is 8, f sub n is 21. Uh, if you have f sub uh, 12, the Fibonacci number is 144. And the algebraic notation um, inside the box uh, basically states that each and every Fibonacci number aside from the first two, uh, one and one, uh, depends on the previous two uh, Fibonacci numbers. For example, uh, if uh, n was uh, 4, then uh, let's see if f was, uh, let's say 11. If uh, n was 10, then um, f sub 11 would be equal to f sub 10 plus f sub 9, which is 55 plus 34, which is equal to 89. And if you look at the table, the 11th term is indeed 89. So I provided a couple examples there of how the notation works and, and how that uh, each number in the series depends upon each previous number in the series. And that's called a recurrence series, uh, when a recurrence relationship. Uh, fractals are recurrence relationships. Any, any sequence or any mathematics that depends on the results of the previous uh, terms uh, is a recurrence sequence. Uh, so <clears throat> this was um, a series that was studied by the, or sequence that was uh, studied by the late 19th century mathematician, French mathematician, Edouard Lucas, who was known for devising a little disc game called the Tower of Hanoi, which you may want to look up. It's a child's uh, game. You see him in, in uh, diners and, and such. And uh, Edward Lucas is the individual who actually gave the name to the sequence uh, as the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, prior to this, it was not known uh, to as the Fibonacci sequence. Now here, uh, I wanted to show the relationship between the Fibonacci sequence and a very important mathematical number that was known to the ancient Greeks as the golden number. Uh, Archimedes uh, knew this number, and the ancient Greeks used this uh, number uh, the golden number, because it was found all over in nature. Uh, it was used by them as the proportioning uh, number for the, the greatest 
uh, aesthetics uh, for um, creating their structures, um, building things. Um, they noticed uh, that this number, uh, the golden number, uh, was found everywhere, and they're related to Fibonacci numbers uh, in a very direct and um, a close manner. <coughs> Here on the left side, in the first two columns, I have the term N, uh, the Fibonacci number that corresponds to the term. And uh, in the third column, uh, you'll see that I have the ratio of the two adjacent Fibonacci numbers. So, for example, um, 8 divided by 5, or 13 divided by 8, um, when you have these ratios, uh, you notice that they converge as you progress down the sequence or up the sequence to higher and higher Fibonacci numbers. Uh, you increasingly uh, approach a number 1.618, uh, and it, it's like pi, and e, uh, there, it's an irrational number, and it goes on forever uh, without uh, repeating itself. It's a never-ending uh, decimal um, point, a never, never repeating uh, pattern, a never ending pattern, like pi, like um, like e, the natural log uh, base. And so um, it's a, a unique number in that sense. Uh, it, it differs from uh, the um, pi and, and e uh, in that it, um, that it is the solution of a, a polynomial or a, a binomial uh, equation, uh, second order equation. But uh, outside of that, it's a, an irrational number. And uh, it's, it's very interesting that it is so intimately related to uh, Fibonacci numbers. The two are really uh, part of the same thing. Uh, in this slide, I just illustrated uh, as best I could uh, the fact that the ancient Greeks did use uh, the golden ratio in their in their structures in the ancient Parthenon, the height of the Parthenon uh, to the width of the base of the par Parthenon, that ratio. Uh, is the golden number, which is represented by the Greek letter phi, uh, the zero with the line, vertical line drawn through it. Um, it was common to see how the ancient Greeks used this number, golden number, one plus the square root of five over two, uh, to proportion uh, their, their most important uh, structures. And the Parthenon is a, a standing example of how they did that. Uh, with the golden number, uh, we'll take a look at how the ancient Greeks uh, devised the, the golden number. And in this slide, we'll, we show how that it's done through a section. Now that middle line that you see there that I didn't label, you see the red lines A and B and A plus B. Well, that is, um, those are representing the section that I put in, in between them, that purple line. And you divide it in such a way that the ratio of the section A to B is the same as the whole a plus B is to the longer section, A. And I wrote that out in the left side of the slide below the lines. Um, and you see the ratios A plus B over A equals A over B. And when you, when you do some algebraic rearranging, 
um, and I used a substitute uh, a dummy variable x for the ratio a to b, uh, you set up this equation, uh, as you can see here in the second column, uh, where I have x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0. If you uh, solve that equation uh, using the quadratic formula, uh, you end up with the ratio a to b equals 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2 exactly, and that is how you devise or how you derive uh, the uh, golden number in an exact fashion. Um, and you can see here, uh, I carried it out to, I don't know what, 10 different decimal places. I, I didn't count them. Uh, but it goes on forever, uh, never-ending uh, decimals, uh, never repeat. The, a, a pattern, uh, so it's an irrational number. And uh, it's, li again, like um, pi or, or uh, the natural base, uh, the natural log. And um, so it's, it's a, a very uh, simple means of, of devising the uh, golden golden section, they call that. <clears throat> In this slide, I show how the ancient Greeks constructed a golden rectangle. And basically, they started with a square. And a golden rectangle is, the, is a rectangle in, whose dimensions are, are such that the uh, base length, Q, uh, to the side, uh, L, is exactly the uh, golden number. And the way they did it is you take a square and divide it in half, um, which you see in solid lines, and then you draw a diagonal at the base of the uh, section that, that cuts the square in half up to one of the diagonals, and then you rotate, pivot it down, in an arc, as you can see in the dotted lines, and you can extend out the sides of the re of the square uh, to uh, the the length of that arc. And uh, as you can see, uh, I have done so with the dotted lines, and you can see it forms a rectangle. And when you do the algebra. Uh, using Pythagorean th theorem to uh, derive the length uh, r of the hypotenuse of that, that line, that diagonal, and uh, obtain the length of the base, q, using a little algebra, you find that the ratio uh, q to the side, l, is exactly phi. Uh, which is 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2. Now, this is a, a golden rectangle, and it's used uh, commonly because they, they say this uh, proportioning is very aesthetic to the human eye. It's, it's far more aesthetic to, than a square. Uh, if you notice uh, uh, paper, for example, 11 and a half, 8 by 11 and a half, um, it's uh, nearly a golden rectangle. There's something more aesthetic to uh, that shape as opposed to other, uh, other proportions. Uh, for example, a square, we don't write on square papers or we don't build square homes. We build rectangular homes and it's more aesthetic to the eye. Watchmakers. Uh, between uh, the numbers, I think it's 2 and, and 9 and uh, 5 and 7. Uh, if you construct a, um, a rectangle between those numbers, uh, you can, or I think it's 10. 10, 10 and 2 and, and um, 5 and 7. 
uh, creates a uh, golden rectangle. And watchmakers do that on, pay on purpose uh, because there is an aesthetic uh, in, in looking uh, at the configuration uh, that is pleasing to the human eye. And that's why the ancient Greeks used this um, dimensioning. In fact, uh, Leonardo da Vinci used it to proportion human body, and he called it the divine proportion. Now, there's an alternate way of, of creating a um, golden rectangle, and I show that here. And you start out with uh, two squares of uh, the same size. Um, here we call them side one. Uh, and <clears throat> you, you abut them together, and um, then you build off another square off their side, uh, which is side two, and then you build another square, which is side three, and you can continue doing so forever. I, I didn't have much space here, so I only carried it out to three uh, terms, but you notice for, for one thing uh, that the squares um, uh, progress in size, uh, length size, uh, according to the Fibonacci sequence. You'll have um, one, two, three. The next one could be five, as you could see, three plus one and one. Uh, would create a square 5, and the next one off of that would be 8, and 13, and 21, and so on. And if you connect and construct quarter circles that join uh, at, the, at the junction of where the uh, squares join, uh, you create a spiral, an arc that you see that I've drawn here. And if you just continue that, that spiral outwards as you build out this rectangle, uh, not only do you uh, increasingly uh, approach uh, becoming a perfect golden rectangle, you've created a golden spiral within that golden rectangle by joining these quarter circle arcs at tangent points. And uh, this, this golden spiral is found all over nature, it, you know, seashells and galaxies and such. And we'll take a look at some photos. Uh, also uh, important uh, was the, the golden rectangle or triangle. Uh, as you can see uh, above the rectangle that I've drawn there, that the golden rectangle has a side uh, to base ratio uh, that is equal to the golden number. And we'll take a look at that a little bit more closely in the next example, which involves the pentagon. And the pentagon, or pentagram, which is the five-pointed star, uh, is the symbol of the Fibonacci Society, for one thing. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it turns out that each of the points of a regular uh, pentagram, uh, the five-pointed star, um, are golden, or golden triangles. And the point-to-point -point distance, the ratio of the point-to-point -point distance to the length p that I have diagrammed here in this illustration uh, is exactly the golden number. And in order to demonstrate that, we have to use both geometry and um, we have to use trigonometry. And it can be readily seen that the pentagram fits within a uh, pentagon. Uh, if you overlay the pentagon, if you just join the points of the pentagram, you have, or pentagon, pentagram, you end up with a pentagon. And you can calculate the angles uh, within the pentagram 
by constructing a, a pentagon uh, that, that fits exactly from point to point uh, on the pentagram. And so the pentagram actually uh, is the, the means by which a pentagon is constructed. And you can obtain the, the angles inside. And here on the pentagram, uh, you can see uh, that I divided it up. You take one of the vertices of the pentagon and you divide it up into three triangles and the sum of the angles of each triangle is each triangle is 180 degrees and you have three triangles uh, that fit within a pentagon uh, for a total of 540 degrees and so that is the sum of the interior angles and there are five interior angles so each angle is 108 degrees and that's a pretty nifty trick so if you have any uh, regular uh, geometric figure an octagon and so on you can uh, determine the number of interior angles um, by constructing uh, these these uh, triangles inside the the figure and then summing up the um, summing up the angles, the hundred, you know, the triangles, how many different 180 degrees, and then uh, dividing it by the number of sides. Well, here, this is just uh, a slide showing that uh, I'm working with the overlay of the pentagon over the pentagram to um, determine the interior angles and in particular I'm looking for the angle beta on the point. Now the point again uh, is a uh, is a golden tri a golden triangle and I know the length uh, L each side on a regular uh, pentagram is side L uh, but I'm looking for the the angle uh, beta at the base of the triangle because I need the distance x and x is the cosine L times the cosine of the angle beta and so I need to uh, figure out what that angle beta is uh, because um, that distance uh, to x is, is critical to determine in order to find out that ratio L to Q. And so we find out using a little bit of trigonometry that the, the angle beta is 72 degrees. And when you plug that into our algebraic expressions, uh, you find that uh, the length L to the the distance Q is uh, 2 times uh, bracketed 1 plus cosine 72 degrees uh, over 1 plus 2 times cosine of 72 degrees. And when you take that ratio and calculate the, uh, the cosine of 72 degrees, you end up with the golden ratio again. Uh, L to Q is exactly the golden ratio. And that's a pretty remarkable thing with the pentagram. Now here's another uh, application uh, that's very important with the binomial. Now the binomial is a very important mathematical expression. Uh, that's used in statistics, it's uh, used in compound interest, and there are many different applications. And the binomial is just simply the polynomial 1 plus x raised to the n. Now, it, it can be expanded by raising the power of n, and I've done so in that table. Um, I have n and the corresponding uh, result if uh, for for any particular n. So example, 
uh, when n is 2, you have the expanded binomial is x squared plus 2x plus 1, and the larger the n, uh, the larger the polynomial becomes, and it becomes more and more difficult to find the various coefficients. Uh, for example, with um, with n equals 4, you have x to the 4th plus 4x to the 3rd plus 6x squared plus 4x plus 1. Well, how do you get those? Um, a young mathematician by the, young, uh, by the name of uh, Blaise Pascal, he was a French mathematician of the 17th century, uh, found a way uh, to uh, a nice trick. Uh, they name it Pascal's Triangle, even though the Chinese knew about it even earlier. Um, you construct uh, initially a triangle of one, one, and one, and you add, uh, you just keep extending the sides of the triangle out with ones, and the interior numbers are just the sum of the two numbers above it. So uh, if, if you look at the triangle below, uh, at the bottom right, you can see that uh, 2 is the product uh, or the uh, sum of the two uh, ones above it. And the threes um, in, the, in the next line below um, uh, are the sum of 2 and 1, and um, they, they correspond with n equals 3. And so you can find the, the coefficients uh, for e, you know, the expanded, um, the expanded poly, uh, binomial uh, rather quickly. Uh, by constructing this triangle. In fact, I, I did so for n equals 4, which is at the base here, and the coefficients are 1, 4, 6, 4, and 1. And if you look at the expanded um, uh, binomial in the table above, you see I have uh, the coefficients are 1, 4, 6, uh, 4, and 1. Uh, in the expanded binomial. So uh, this, this was a, uh, an interesting um, way of finding the uh, coefficients without having to brute force calculate, uh, which gets harder and harder as n gets bigger. Uh, so it was an easy way of finding the coefficients for the expanded binomial. Well, it turns out uh, that this golden rectangle, or this uh, Pascal's triangle, has uh, some very interesting properties. And it's, uh, it, these properties are, are really fascinating. And uh, here, what I did was I showed how the, for any given uh, n um, for the, the, the power of the binomial, uh, 1 plus x all raised to the n power, how the coefficients um, are calculated for any particular power. And I, I calculated it out to the fifth power, and the coefficients here, as you can see, are 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, and 1, so that would correspond with the um, polynomial um, x to the fifth plus 5x to the fourth uh, plus 10x to the third plus 10x to the, uh, to the second, or squared, uh, plus 5x plus 1. And that would be that the quick way of finding the coefficients for the expanded uh, polynomial uh, without having to do a brute force calculation. And it's pretty ingenious. But what's remarkable about this is that when you add the coefficients, the diagonal 
of the coefficients uh, of the expanded binomial, uh, and, and that's what Blaise Pascal's triangle is, uh, just uh, the expansion or, or the representation of the expanded coefficients, if you add up the diagonals of Pascal's triangle, it yields the Fibonacci sequence. And here I, I demonstrated that uh, by drawing the lines through uh, the different terms in the, um, in the uh, Pascal's triangle. And you can see that the, the each uh, diagonal sums up exactly to a Fibonacci number. Now, this is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. I mean, that means uh, hidden within uh, the binomial is the Fibonacci sequence. It just is a natural um, uh, fundamental uh, property of the binomial. And the binomial uh, is used in uh, statistics and dealing with large numbers and collections of data. Uh, most, uh, most uh, in fact, uh, statistics really derive from the study of nature where there are large uh, quantities of data that have to be manipulated and you need statistics to be able to digest and make the the data meaningful and it's just fascinating that the Fibonacci sequence would be hidden uh, but there present within uh, within the uh, such a critical um, area of mathematics now, Fibonacci numbers are also found throughout nature, as I hinted or alluded to in the previous slide um, by statistics and collections of data. Uh, botanists knew about Fibonacci numbers um, early in the 19th century uh, and used it as a means of classifying pa uh, plants and they call that phylotaxis. Now, if you notice uh, your garden plants in the summer, uh, the leaves of your flowers will grow in a spiral pattern around the stalk or the stem. And um, you'll start uh, with any, any, any of the leaves. Uh, if you go around uh, the stem, you'll come to a point up the stem where you'll find a leaf that is directly over your starting leaf. I, I indicated that by the dashed line. And if you count the number of leaves uh, going around in that spiral, it will be a Fibonacci number. And then, uh, in addition, if you count the number of turns or spir spirals, um, basically a helix, that's what a, um, a, a spiral that moves uh, up upwards, that's a helix, like the coil of a spring, uh, that will also uh, be a Fibonacci number. In this case, I, I drew it so that uh, there were three turns and five leaves. And so the, the phylotaxis was the ratio five to three. And botanists actually used this means uh, to classify um, plants. And so they, they, that's what the term phylotaxis means. It's a, it means a, a way of ca uh, classifying plants. And this is uh, universal throughout, I mean, even trees, uh, display this property when they're young. And so uh, this was something that was known long ago. But as the scientific revolution progressed during the 19th century, it became evident that Fibonacci numbers were found universally throughout nature. And um, it wasn't just uh, in isolated places or in man-made fabricated uh, applications like the 
Parthenon, but it was all over the place in plants and, and nature. And I have a couple of illustrations here that you'll find at, at the beach, starfish, uh, with the, the regular pentagram, um, the same with the sea urchins and sand dollars, um, nautiluses uh, make golden uh, spirals, as well as other shells like whelks. Uh, one of the things that really sparked me uh, early on uh, were pine cones. Now, if you take a pine cone and look at the base of the pine cone, you'll notice that the bracts, uh, these are the seed bracts of the cone, um, will form a spiral in toward the center of the cone. And here I outlined each of the spirals in red lines so that you can see them better. And if you count in, uh, the, in the counterclockwise direction, uh, starting with uh, one of the spirals that go in, and in fact, those are golden spirals, uh, you count the number of spirals in, uh, you'll get 13. And in this particular case, it's 13. Some uh, pine cones have five, others have eight. It depends on the pine cone you pick up. Even on, for the same tree, uh, different sized pine cones have different uh, uh, numbers, but there'll always be a Fibonacci number. If they're not, rarely will you find it a uh, Lucas number. Uh, which is similar to a Fibonacci number, but um, in, in most cases it will be a Fibonacci number. And in this case, it's 13. Now, if you notice, the same pine cone has cross-hatching spirals that go in the opposite direction, in the clockwise direction, and makes a cross-hatch pattern. And I highlighted these cross-hatching spirals in uh, yellow. And uh, if you count them uh, in the clockwise direction, you'll notice that there, for one thing, there are fewer uh, than the previous um, uh, example. And this is the same pine cone. Uh, there were 13 in the counterclockwise direction. In the clockwise direction, there are eight spirals. And so for this pine cone, you have 13 and 8. And no matter what pine cone you pick up, uh, they will always be uh, adjacent Fibonacci numbers. For example, um, with uh, um, sunflower seeds, uh, the heads of the sunflowers form a similar cross-hatching spiral pattern. In fact, most plants do, if you look at them. And uh, for example, with the sunflowers, uh, you can find that the number of spirals in one direction is 144, and then you count the opposite uh, direction for the spiral uh, in the seed head of a sunflower, it'll be 89. So you have 144 and 89. Or, or 55 and 34. It all depends on how large the seed head is. And this is true for most uh, plants. And this is just phenomenal uh, that you have this, this property that's so universally displayed in the plant world. Um, sea life. Uh, and in, in nature in general, you'll find things like golden spirals. Um, golden spirals are found in vortices. Now you look at uh, galaxies, uh, spiral, two-thirds of the universe are spiral galaxies, and uh, you can readily see that these uh, spiral galaxies uh, form golden spirals. The same with whirlpools, and this is a, an example of what Old Sow, which is a famous, in fact, the world's largest whirlpool uh, in the Bay of Funday. And it's very dangerous if you, 
if you don't have a, a powerful boat with a reliable engine, you can uh, you can readily die in old sow. Hurricanes and weather fronts uh, form golden spirals, and as you can see in this thermal uh, imagery, uh, where the energy is, and that's uh, where the heavy rain bands form, that these bands form golden spirals around the eye of the storm. Uh, the same is true for low uh, pressure systems, and they'll make large uh, golden spirals in the formation of weather fronts. So these golden spirals are found everywhere. So I'm just wetting your taste, uh, so to speak, just to give you an idea of where Fibonacci numbers are, can be found because they're, they're located everywhere in nature. I mean, everywhere you look, uh, Fibonacci numbers are found. And uh, it, it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. Uh, this is something that uh, is so broad, you just can't, there's, there's no end to it. I mean, you, the, wherever you look, uh, in nature, you'll find uh, either the golden mean or Fibonacci numbers. Now back a little bit to the mathematics of uh, Fibonacci numbers and the golden mean. Uh, there are some interesting mathematical properties. In fact, actually, there are a lot of interesting mathematical properties. And uh, so much so that a math, uh, mathematical society uh, comprised of uh, academics all over the world um, belong to an association called the Fibonacci Association. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but there's so much mathematics that it warrants uh, this attention. And, um, for example, in uh, the golden number, uh, which I have presented here and, and derived the, the exact value for the golden number, phi, well, if you look at the uh, equation on the left side, I have phi equals 1 over phi plus 1. It's interesting that uh, the that phi, um, if you take the uh, reciprocal of phi uh, and divide it, uh, invert it, uh, you get the decimal portion of phi. <laughs> and so, uh, this is a very unusual property that the uh, that phi would have this uh, reciprocal relationship. And so uh, the mathematics there is pretty interesting. Uh, here's another example, something that I worked out on my own a couple of years back, uh, where um, if, you, if you take um, two Fibonacci numbers, for example, um, the seventh term and the fifth term, uh, 13 and 5, and you multiply them and subtract uh, the square of the middle term, 8, uh, you'll get um, either 1 or minus 1. And in this case, uh, it's 1. But as you move down uh, the Fibonacci sequence uh, and, and uh, perform this operation, you'll alternate between 1 and negative 1. And you can see that I've done that here for you in the, in the left side um, and showed you how that, that works. And then I, I created a, an algebraic expression for that on the right side and did a little algebra and uh, created a, an equation in the box. And when you I, I, again, I used the dummy variable x for the ratio uh, fn plus 1 to fn, and then solved the subsequent quadratic equation. I ended up with a two-term representation of the Fibonacci number. So remember, 
the Fibonacci number said uh, that um, each term is dependent on the sum of the two previous terms. So you'll always have three uh, different uh, variables. You have fn plus 1 equals fn plus uh, fn minus 1. Well, uh, this uh, relationship uh, works uh, in order to uh, express Fibonacci numbers. Um, each term of the Fibonacci number is uh, an expression of the previous Fibonacci number uh, instead of the two previous Fibonacci numbers. So it's fun. I mean, you can work out these things. Uh, and, and there's a limitless number of uh, very interesting mathematical properties that are associated with uh, the Fibonacci sequence. And uh, so much so uh, that a um, that an association of academics was formed called the Fibonacci Association. And the Fibonacci Association is a global organization um, of mathematicians, academics from universities all over the world. Uh, they publish this quarterly called the Fibonacci Quarterly. Notice the pentagram as their symbol. And in this journal, they uh, publish um, all the discoveries, uh, mathematical discoveries associated with the Fibonacci sequence and related mathematics, related recurrence relationships. And this association uh, was put together in 1963 and has been uh, in existence since. And you'll find this journal um, in any uh, academic library. In fact, in many libraries that are non-academic libraries, uh, you'll find this journal. But uh, mostly in college campuses throughout the world, you'll find uh, the Fibonacci Quarterly. And uh, people uh, can submit articles or uh, problems that are unique and, uh, and um, haven't, are original and haven't been uh, discovered before and submit it to the Fibonacci Quarterly and they'll publish them. Uh, I've had a number of problems uh, published in the Fibonacci Quarterly, and um, here's an example of where I had a problem submitted, and uh, it doesn't look like something that uh, is easy to recognize, but it ba basically uh, says that uh, any matrix made up of... Uh, of Fibonacci elements uh, will always be zero. Uh, they say singular. Uh, singular means uh, zero. And um, it, it was not the way I proposed it, but this is how they wrote it out in a more general form. Uh, they, they were kind of uh, interested in that I wasn't a, a mathematician. They, they called me up, the editor called me up and asked me if I was an academic mathematician. And I said, no, I'm a, an engineer, but I'm fascinated with Fibonacci numbers. And they published it. In fact, I had uh, at least three, maybe four, I can't remember now, uh, problems published in the Fibonacci Quarterly. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do. It really is a, an interesting uh, topic. I mean, absolutely fascinating. Um, 30 years ago, uh, fewer people knew about the Fibonacci numbers. Um, and since the advent of the internet, uh, there's a plethora of information about Fibonacci numbers on the internet. And what I suggest is that you work out the problems yourself because they, the, the, it's more fun that way. I've derived many uh, fundamental 
uh, identities and relationships uh, that were worked out by academic mathematicians uh, years before, um, not knowing that they had done so. And rather than, rather than uh, look it up and, and try to find these relationships, it's much more fun deriving them on your own. Uh, even if you uh, discover that somebody else had found this relationship in a previous, uh, at a previous time, it still makes you feel good that you were able to independently derive the same thing. And it's fun. It just uh, is something that's fun to do. So aside from the intellectual exercise of the mathematical part of Fibonacci numbers, uh, it is, it is uh, so much of a, a joy, fun, to see how prevalent uh, these numbers are in nature and tells you about the fundamental uh, aspects of our universe and how it works, that it, it's basically a, a mathematical universe. Uh, there's always been this philosophical question, is math a, a language that we overlay on nature and and have discovered and and derived to explain nature or is the nature inherently mathematical and and we're discovering nature as we discover different aspects of math and i tend to fall into the category of believing that the world and the universe that we live in is inherently mathematical and that we are discovering new things about the universe, new essential aspects of the universe when we discover new mathematical entities uh, rather than thinking it's a human fabrication. I just, I think that's how nature works. Nature is inherently mathematical. But anyway, that's a, an ongoing debate, and uh, I'm not going to get into that at this point. Uh, it's just my personal feeling. And, and I just hope I, I wanted to introduce you to Fibonacci numbers and uh, let you know uh, how prevalent they are. Uh, and uh, hope to stoke your curiosity to looking into this topic uh, on your own uh, a little bit more so and doing some research on your own. So there, <clears throat> it's, it's something that brings a lot of happiness and joy. It's, it's really something uh, very unique about mathematics. And that sounds like an oxymoron, you know, fun, mathematics being fun, but it can be, and it can be a joy. Um, in fact, uh, and there's an author that I really enjoy very much. She was a school teacher. Uh, her name is Theone Pappas, and uh, years back she published uh, several books called The Joy of Mathematics and More Joy of Mathematics. And I, I think altogether she published 10, 12 uh, different books on mathematics, trying to get people to see and understand mathematics as something as, as fun. And she presents uh, the mathematics in a vignette. It's not a textbook. Uh, but as uh, interesting little vignettes with some history and description of what it means. And she's an excellent mathematics communicator. And I, even though they, her, many of her topics include Fibonacci numbers, uh, there's no question there. But she, she has a very broad spectrum uh, that, of mathematics that she covers in her books, and I highly recommend Theone Pappas. So 
uh, if you can, uh, I, I would highly recommend that you look into uh, Theone Pappas's uh, Joy of Math and More Joy of Math. This is Math Man wishing you the very best.